guys are great. I remember you. I remember you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Good to see you too, man. Thanks. That was really, really good. That was. Uh, that was. Uh, yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just you watch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, it's it's great. Um, it's good to be uh, back. And man, thanks for. Uh, thanks for coming back this morning. I, <laughs> you never know, and uh, I'm just I'm honored. I'm just glad to, to be here, to, to be with you, and really enjoyed uh, you guys last night. Looking forward to all day today and whatever God's going to do. And uh, thanks for just uh, clearing your calendar and being here on a Friday. I mean, I know it's a lot of going on in life and stuff, and but it's good to be away and good to be with other men, and uh, also good to be with the Lord. What he has to say to us, you know. I, you know, I was just just thinking back there. Uh, you know, my, uh, I mean, I got all kind of. You know, it's it's pretty amazing, and and uh, our pastor knows this, uh, and Joe knows this as well, and, 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 and any pastor does. But you know, I uh, uh, I talked talk last night for an hour. That's a long time. Yeah, I'm fifty. I'm in fifteen minutes. I stand correct. I probably thought. That's even more amazing. All right, 15 minutes. I mean, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I woke him up twice. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, didn't mean the body. I didn't snap. Yeah, you nap. But, but I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, that's amazing. And uh, I mean, what do you say for an hour? I mean, uh, if you'd ever tell me, you know, especially one time in my life that I'd be standing up I'm talking to you with me for an hour and 15 minutes, I say, no, you, are you crazy? I mean, one, I'm not sure I can I do that as a stutterer, but two, I don't think I have all that much to say. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the day. You know, I'm going to talk essentially an hour now, and then we'll take a break, and then, and then another hour, and then this evening we've got another hour, and then tomorrow we got, I guess, two more of those, two 45-minute sessions, I guess. But, um, really just a lot of, I mean, just just in my head, you know, just 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 you know, trying to keep all that together. I mean, where are we going next? You know, I'm saying this. What next? And you know, there's a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I got all kind of stuff in my head. But you know what? My my only desire is, you know, this whole thing. Because I get all worked up about, you know what I'm supposed to do, what I need to do, what, you know, the, the outline I'm supposed to follow, the person I'm supposed to go to, and, you know, all that stuff, what, what goes here, so boom, 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 all that stuff that you got as a speaker. But, you know, really, my, my only desire is, I'm just, just kind of praying that, that, um, that, that, that somehow, some way, God just says something to all of us. I mean, really speaks through uh, whatever I, uh, I think I'm supposed to say, or the outline I'm supposed to use, or, or, or the topics, or the, or the verses, or the illustrations, I mean, all that stuff, and there's a whole lot of that stuff in there, but, but I'm just praying, a, a, a bottom line, that, that uh, the God we just sang about, the God who created all this, I mean, he's real, he's out there, and you know what, there's nothing he wants to do, nothing he wants to do that more honors him, more glorifies him, and more pleases him than to touch a man's life and just change that man and, just, and make that man a whole new creation in Christ Jesus. And the man starts living in a different way. And, and essentially, that's what we're going to um, talk about this morning is, uh, is in our second idea. Uh, our first idea is a man who's worthy of following. That man needs to be a man who, who is passionately pursuing and following Jesus. And, he, and he's passionately he, he's passionately. Uh, pursuing an intimate, personal, powerful relationship with Jesus Christ, and and, and he he is following Jesus, and because he's he's he's, he's powerfully pursuing Christ, everyone who, who he touches, especially what who follows him, ends up following who he's following, Jesus, which is, uh, and I'm going to share this in, in the next session, is is really the, the testimony of my life as I follow my dad. My dad was an athlete. He was an incredible guy. 
great, he was a great speaker, funny, entertaining, great salesman kind of guy. I mean, just every, I wanted to be just like my dad, as, as most boys do. And I just realized after I was just, just following my dad, I wanted to be like him. And all the boys in my family had this exact same testimony. We ended up following who he was following, Jesus. Which obviously is that whole idea of what Paul says. Paul said to the Corinthians, hey, you follow me as I follow Christ. And my dad, he simply said, hey, you boys, you, are you, you, you follow your dad as I follow Jesus. And he led us right to the Lord. With his words, yes, but far more than his words, with his life, yes. Well, here's the second idea uh, today. And uh, the second thought, if, if um, um, I'm going to be a man that, that, is, that uh, lives, uh, lives a life worthy of imitation. It's this thought, and, and I uh, to really don't have a, 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 uh, a good way to say this. And so, so I've got to say it. Because the words I use to uh, title it really doesn't make sense uh, in, in, in some way. I mean, it does, but, it, but, but you might not understand it. So I've got it. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. But here's the idea. Here are the words. That man needs to live. Of course, first, he's pursuing Jesus. He wants to know Jesus. He's Lord of his life. But then secondly, he is living in the active, manifest presence of God in his life. The power of God is in his life, and it's coming through his life. And he's living not in his own strength, his own power. He's living every moment in the active, manifest presence and power of God in his life. Now, the point is, um, I, I guess, uh, you, know, you know, God is everywhere. No, uh, uh, God is present everywhere. You know, that's one of the things he says, he says in Psalms 139. You know, you know uh, anywhere you go, I'm already there. You know, you go up to the heavens, I'm already there. You go to Sheol, I'm already there. You go as far as east as the, in, in, in the west and north, I'm there. I'm already, he's everywhere. He, he's, act, he, uh, he's, he's present everywhere. Now, he's not always present. Powerfully active everywhere. You know, there are some places in the world. Now, obviously, God is everywhere in the world. But there are some places in the world that incredible revivals are going on. Where God is not just there. God is doing something that is so powerful. He's powerfully active in some places. And every once in a while, he shows up in, of course, again, he's everywhere. He's already there. And he's a, but, but every once in a while, he shows up in a powerful way and just does something. And when he does that thing, whatever it is, everybody knows, whoa, that was God. That was awesome. Well, what happened was, does he, he, he God, in some form or fashion, act, actively manifest himself, showed himself clear, as if he shows up and says, hey, I'm God, and I'm in the house, that, that, that kind of idea, you know. It's a little bit like, um, you know, Robbie here. Hey, Robbie, how's it going? You know, you know, if Robbie's here, and and just uh, and say he was here all week, but you don't know Robbie, so he's here, he's present, but you don't know him. Um, although he's present, and being manifest is if Robbie stands up and says, "Hey, I'm Robbie, and I'm here." Well, he just manifests <laughs> now. You know Robbie's in the house. You know he's here. Why? But because because he just doesn't hear. You don't see him. You don't know him. He actually got manifest. He stands up and boom, everybody sees. That's Robbie. Robbie's here. Well, that's the idea about living in the active manifest presence of Jesus Christ. Where, where he, he shows up in the man. And, and then some, that's what the phrase I said last night. If something supernatural is in the man, something supernatural ought to be coming out of the man. In his life. It is how he thinks and what he does, how he reacts, how he loves, how he how he handles situations, how he he deals with stuff. You know, I was just in the singing that time we were singing, I look at uh, uh, isn't that a good little thing right there? In 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 happy moments praise God, difficult moments seek God, quiet moments worship God, painful moments trust God, every moment thank God. That's pretty dang good. And I was also singing back there and and 
What's on the back of your shirt? Yeah, I, I saw that. In, in, uh, uh, read what's on the back of your shirt. <laughs> you can't read it away. What does that say on the back of your shirt? That's pretty good. I, I, I bet. And it's on an Aggie shirt, by the way. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's even. <laughs> and it's spelled right. That's, that's even. That's even. That's even. That's, that's even. That's even supernatural, but it's it's the uh, it's it's the if some supernatural is in the man, some supernatural ought to be coming out of the man. Well, let's look at a few things in in, in the Bible. This kind of, uh, look first of all at First Corinthians, First uh, um, Corinthians uh, two, and uh, this is Paul. First Corinthians two, that um, I think it's First Corinthians two. Yeah, uh, yeah. First Corinthians, chapter two. Well, uh, Paul, of course, is writing here, and he's 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 giving a little testimony of of uh, when he came to Corinth, and and so he he um, here's how he says this. And Paul says, "When I came to you, brothers, I uh, I did not come proclaim to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom." He says, first of all, hey, uh, I came to you. I wasn't all that good of a speaker. And, and, and in fact, I, I, wasn't, uh, I didn't have great wisdom in, 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 in one sense. You know, I love that verse. That Paul came, and he, and he was not a great speaker. He didn't say it. Uh, he thought. Now, obviously, he said it well, but because God used him so. But, but he didn't say it. I mean, um, uh, he felt this was a weakness in his life. That uh, that uh, I didn't didn't come to you with with lofty speech or with you know I, I just I just had this thought of that whole phrase or the whole story about Moses you know Moses uh, he may have stuttered as well uh, it says four ten and God God called him he says Lord I, uh, I can't do this I got a thick slow stammering tongue he said <laughs> we don't it's amazing when. Uh, to say he he stuttered extremely well, but he goes up on the mountain and experiences God. Comes down from the mountain and he meets Aaron. And somehow, some way, Moses, who obviously couldn't speak well, but just just spoke and said, told Aaron what God had just done in his life. And Aaron got the message powerfully. You know why? Because he had just experienced God. Paul says this, hey, I came to you, I, I wasn't a great speaker, or lofty or speech of wisdom. And, he said, verse 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. And my speech and message were not in plausible words of, of wisdom. Now, that kind of, you know, I always have this idea of the Apostle Paul just kind of being this, you know, this John Wayne kind of Christian guy. But you don't know who, who John. Uh, uh, he remembers John Wayne. He remember, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. I mean uh, he can't get any better than John Wayne, huh? What? Exactly. Well said. That's well said. But but you know, just I always saw Paul as being this uh, this this John Wayne. I mean, just just nothing bothered him. Just I mean, just it, it don't matter where he is. Just just walking into a situation and say, hey, hey. Everybody on the floor. I mean, everybody hit the ground. I mean, just, just in, but he says here, no, I came to in what? In, 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 in weakness and in much fear and in trembling, he says. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in what? In the demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith may not rest in wisdom of men, but on the power. What was happening in Paul's life was he said, "Hey, humanly speaking, I got all these I got all these issues in my life. Man, I'm not that smart. I'm not that big. I'm not that strong. And I'm I've got this weak. I got this fear. I got this trembling. But in the midst of all that, God is doing something in my life. When I showed up to you, Corinthians, he said, "You know, it wasn't my gifts that blew you away. It was the power of God in my life that blew you away." That's what he said. Look at this. Uh, uh, this one chapter over, First Corinthians four twenty. He says. Uh, um, he says here, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk or in words, but in power. You know, 
Too many men lose their, their witness and, and influence on their children. You know why? All they do is talk. They're always talking about this. Talk, 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 talk. And after a while, the kid realizes, you know what? There's nothing real in my dad. It's all fake and phony. He says one thing at church. He's doing something else. He, 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 talk, he talks a good game, but he doesn't walk the thing. And he just, it's all talk, talk, talk. Because a, a kid knows, he knows, hey, this isn't a talk thing. It's a life thing. And if he doesn't see it, what he needs to see is not somebody who just talks a good game, but it's somebody who's walking and living in the presence of Almighty God and the active manifest presence of God. And it's showing up in his life, through his life. What he's doing, it's a, it's a powerful thing. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to look at Peter and just and to see three experiences in, in Peter's life where, where uh, something amazing. Now look at, at uh, Matthew 16. Uh, this is uh, the idea of, of living in the active, manifest presence of God, of God doing them suit of some supernatural being in the man and some supernatural uh, coming out of the man. So here, Matthew 16, verse, verse, verse 13. And, and obviously, this is where uh, Jesus um, asked his disciples, he's at Caesarea Philippi. This is a wonderful place and has all, all these pagan gods. And, uh, it, it's where they worshipped everything and, and so forth. And so he asked them a question, he says this. Now when the, uh, Jesus, verse 13, came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the, the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Everybody had an opinion. But actually, nobody actually knew who he was. And so he said to them, Jesus did, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What's interesting, that hadn't been manifested yet, that whole idea. And and. Here is, is Jesus' response to that. He says, verse, verse 7, Jesus, uh, Peter had just said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, blessed, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I Meaning you got this not from human wisdom, not from human knowledge. You didn't get this from a man. From, you got this from God Almighty who supernaturally communicated to your heart a supernatural thought, and you said that out loud uh, and made it in, in fact out loud in the world supernaturally because God, what's happening there, he is saying something supernatural. Because Jesus is right there. He, he, uh, he's saying stuff he didn't even know he knew. He's just saying, you know, uh, uh, it's just uh, often you can be preaching sometimes and just and just going along and just kind of, I mean, you, you and all of a sudden you say something and and you hear it come out of your mouth and you even think, you know, uh, you're uh, up there speaking and, 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 and you're saying this and all of a sudden you think to yourself, man, that was really good. <laughs> uh, and you even think, uh, I didn't even know I knew that. I mean, I don't remember studying that. You know what's another amazing thing? You can preach some places and, and, and preach a sermon, and after you walk out, you walk out, and some guy walks up and says, man, you know when you said this? And, and he says what he thinks you said, but I know, I never said that. I mean, he makes a statement or tells something, and I know it's not in my notes. In fact, I've never, even, I've never said what he said I said. What was that? That was the supernatural spirit of God saying not what just I wanted to say, said what that guy needed to hear, even though I didn't even say it. Now, that's a supernatural thing. And what happens is uh, uh, Peter is saying something supernatural. You know, it's the idea of being, of being so, so uh, uh, passionately pursuing Jesus. He's so real in my life. He's doing something so uh, active and and. and, and powerful in my life it's showing itself powerful through what i say so and and, and you know what? i have uh, this experience no i lean on this experience of, of of just being in a situation where i don't know what to do almost every day in my life now of course most days i'm, I'm you know i'm just doing stuff in the office no big deal I, uh, I can handle anything you know it's no big deal but a lot of days you know i've I'm uh, on the way to the hospital to see him, uh, as I did two weeks ago. A 19-year-old boy who's in the last stages of uh, brain cancer. I mean, he, he, 
he's basically, it's, actually, I saw him on a Wednesday. Uh, he died on a Thursday. And you're walking into this family to see this family, and I talked to his mom and dad, the precious people. they got this good-looking stud of a guy who's lost. I mean, he's, he's, he's a skeleton. You know, I'm, I, I feel myself just, just, just driving down, thinking, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be playing golf. I'd rather be out doing anything, but but I don't want to. And the feeling is, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? I don't have the answers to this thing. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. All those are real feelings. And you know what? All of a sudden, you get in the hospital, and you walk, you park your car, you go up near the door, and all of a sudden, there's the door, and you know what's on the inside of that door. And you think, I don't know what, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Man, what do you do? Well, you just trust. Hey, there's a supernatural God who is in me who's in that family as well and wants a representative of him in that room to represent Jesus, to represent his church, to represent the truth of the word of God. And, and I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know how I'm, I'm going to do it, but no, I'm walking in this thing in the spirit of the living God and trusting God to do whatever he wants to do through me in that deal. You know, I get in situations all the time. I don't, I get in a counseling situation. I'm talking to God and I'm thinking, about it. he's telling this story. I'm thinking, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not smart enough for this. And it's amazing how many times I'm just sitting there just begging God, you got to help me do it. All of a sudden, something pops in my head. And all of a sudden, I say something. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, that's pretty daggum good. And, and, and then all of a sudden, it just, and all, and, 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 and all of a sudden, something has come to me, through me, and actually blessed a man who popped. That's the idea. He, he, it, 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 he wasn't just a good talker. God spoke through him. That's the idea. And it isn't just a preacher that God wants to do that. It's any man. And you know, ultimately, it isn't just a man standing in a pulpit and preaching to thousands, it, which as, as, as good as that is. It's a man who at times when his wife needs a word and he speaks whatever she needs to be said, that that, that truth and a powerful about your life. Or it's his son. You know, I remember just, just I, I, I just remember this thought on my, my son. I, I'm going to share this in the next session, this, this story, but I don't know if I'll share it now or not. But uh, I'll go ahead and share it now. Because it popped in my head for some reason. But, but uh, you know, James, my, my son, he was a good athlete as well. I mean, good football player, good, good uh, quarterback. He loved the sportsman's style of sports. He loved to throw something, you know, if I, if I play home in Derby in the backyard or shoot hoops or throw a football. I always wanted to do something. And he was a quarterback. I mean, he, you know, you know some, some, some kids are, are quarterbacks, some kids are not. You know, I mean, you can throw some kids a football, just the way the kid catches the ball and, and, and handles the ball or, or does not handle the ball. You know, uh, he's a lineman. I mean, I mean, it's just obvious. I mean, I mean, that's a tackle right there. I mean, to, but other guys, you throw them the ball just the way they catch the ball, just the way they, they play with the ball. I mean, it's a, that's a quarterback. I mean, I mean that's a guy. That, I mean, that's a leader. That was James. I mean, I'm just a good little eighth grade quarterback. I mean, I he guys, I, I, I just love watching him play. He, he was smart. He threw the ball well. I mean, and, and of course, everybody in his class knew he's the guy. Everybody knew. Well, he stands up in class one day in, in, in the spring of his eighth grade year, and his knee locks. I mean, it's a severe pain. He can't move his knee. Well, he's in severe pain. Well, we must see his, his, a doctor who's an orthopedic surgeon guy, I think I played football with at Baylor, and probably only, he said, ooh, I, you know, he did the whole thing. Ooh, this is bad. This is not good. And he said, you got to go see a specialist. Well, we saw a specialist. He said, ooh, this is, this is not good. And he got some rare a, a, a thing called uh, uh, osteochondritis ditans. It's where the blood flow in a, in, a, in a joint just for some reason stops at, at that point. So all the uh, bone on the other side of where that thing stops, stops getting blood and just dies. Happened in, it, it, it didn't just happen in his right knee. It happened in his left knee also. There's a chance he's never going to walk right. There's a chance he'll never play sports again. Had to have three surgeries, had to reconstruct his right knee. Had to have two surgeries on his right knee, one on his left knee, 
for, for, for uh, uh, 11 months, he's on crutches. He misses all of his, um, uh, all of his baseball eighth grade year, uh, uh, that whole season, all of his uh, freshman year football, uh, basketball and baseball came come back at the end of his sophomore year. But, 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 the, but there's a chance um, he's never going to be an athlete, ever. Well, he, he um, um, had to have, uh, 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 as I said, three surgeries. Uh, in fact, he did one surgery on his right knee, and then a whole bit of his right. And so uh, we go in uh, four months later to do his left knee. And but first, the surgeon wanted to go in his right knee and examine to make sure that it was good. Well, he goes into his right knee again, realizes it's not as good as I want it to be. I'm going to have to redo this. So James wakes up thinking his left knee's been done. He's closer to coming back. Really, no, we didn't do your left knee. We, we had to do your right knee again. Eleven months, he's on crutches. I mean, I hated the sound of those of those crutches just just clanking around my my house. I hated that sound. What that sound represented was why me? Why my family? Why James? Why this? Why are we going? Why does James have to go through all? I mean, all those things. Now, I know the truth, but uh, but uh, but uh, but uh, that's just the real feeling you feel. And James, uh, he did good most of the time. But one night, we're on the bed, he's talking, and he just kind of just starts crying. Dad, why me? Why this? Why do we have to do all this stuff? Uh, all I want to do is, is honor the Lord with my life, be, uh, and, and enjoy sports, and, 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 and why am I going through this? Well, I'm sitting there, and the feeling was, I don't know what to say to him. And I know I can't just bluff him and just, and just say something. And I'm sitting, and all of a sudden, I had this thought. I mean, a thought I'm not sure I've ever had before. I've used this thought in, in, in funerals and situations 10,000 times. Here's, here's the thought. And I, I admit I'm not this smart. Here's what I said. I said, James, there's a whole lot of why questions I don't have the answer to. Like life is full of questions. Why, why, why? I don't know. But James, here's something I'm learning. I'm not going to live my life according to what I don't know. I'm going to live my life according to what I do know. James, here's what I know. I know God loves you. God has a wonderful plan for your life. I know he's going to use this because the Bible says, Romans 8, 28, 29, he's going to use this to conform you into the image of his son, Jesus. I don't like it any more than you. I can't explain it, but we know he's using this to make you more like Jesus. And James, we also know He's going to use this as a witness to all your friends. As they watch a good guy get knocked on his, 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 his back and struggles and how that guy responds faithfully worshiping Jesus in the good and the bad. And you know, also, James, we know somehow, somewhere, he's going to get glory through this whole thing. You know what? That was a word I didn't need to hear. It's a word he needed to hear. Hey, boy, what's awesome about it? God just said what in my family we needed a word. That was the word. You know, I was, I was with the uh, 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 family one time, and, and um, they uh, just got a bad word about, about uh, 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 their cancer. I mean, it's always done. Uh, it's inoperable. It's in this and this, and I'm standing there. I, I, don't, know what, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do, and they're talking this stuff. And, 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 and then they look at me. I'm the preacher. I'm there. Okay. Okay, what are you going to say? So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm just going kind of, well, that's a bad word. And let's let have this thought. But that, that's not the last word. God's going to have the last word in this thing. And that's why we're trusting him. True, this is bad, no question. But you know what? All it is is a word these doctors have. And they're good, they're gifted, they're experienced, but you know what? They don't have the last word. God does. You know what? He wants to do something supernatural through our, 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 uh, our voice as a man. That's the idea. Where's the second idea? Look at Matthew 14. I've got to speed up. I'm, I'm way behind. I, I'm, I'm getting going all over the thing. But, uh, ooh. Um, from Matthew 14. You know the story. We might, might look at this story a little bit later. But, but uh, you know the story. I'm not going to read it because it ends with time. But you know the story. It's where... Uh, the disciples on the boat and, and they're going across the Sea of Galilee and 
All of a sudden, Jesus comes walking on the water. And, and, and they see him walking. At first, they're afraid. And Jesus says, hey, take courage. It, it, it's, it, um, it is I. You don't be afraid. And all of a sudden, Peter, who had just seen Jesus to do a supernatural, because obviously, you know, walking on water is, is, is supernatural, right? I mean, if we, if we have any doubts, we got some water out here. And we can let every one of us try to say, you can't do it. There's no way. You don't walk on water. Jesus did. Peter saw it. Peter said, Lord, if it's you out there, let me I come to you as well. And Jesus said, come on. And Peter gets out of the boat. You know what he does? He walks on water. In Matthew 16, he is, he is uh, saying something supernatural. You know what he's doing here? He is doing something. He's doing what a man can't do. He, he is doing little, but only God. What's happening here? God is, is showing up. And, and obviously, the only reason he, he's walking on the water is because he, he's going to Jesus. Because Jesus is out there. And Jesus said, come. Because Jesus said, come. He's walking. He's, he's doing something supernatural, miraculous. Look at this. Uh, John 8. I uh, know. Uh, John 18. <laughs> Our third example that uh, uh, I want you to see. That... Um, um, Jesus here is uh, uh, he's, uh, he's being arrested in John 18, and uh, you know, uh, you know, first few verses that said, look at verse uh, 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 three, and and Judas is here to arrest him with a band of soldiers and, and, and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, some scholars uh, study all this stuff. I'm not this smart, but, but, but some of you spend their life studying all this stuff. Say that this, this Roman cohort thing that they have here may have been 600 to 1,000 soldiers. May have been as many as 1,200, some experts. But just say 600, so 600 soldiers there and people and temple officers and police are there to arrest Jesus. And, and they're expecting a battle. And, of course, Romans, the... the uh, Roman army loved a good fight. That's, that's, uh, it was the, fight, the, the finest fighting force at that time in the history of the world. I mean, they, they, they had dominated the world uh, through their army. And they were there expecting a battle against this uh, rebellious leader they thought, Jesus, and these, and these and band. So here's what happens. Uh, verse 4, look at verse 4. And then Jesus, knowing all that what happened to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they said... Uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am. I am he, it says. Um, that is actually the phrase, ego I me, in Greek. I am. And the he is actually implied in the ego I me. But it's I am, which obviously is revealed, the covenant name of God. God gave Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses, when, when God speaks to him in the burning a bush and, 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 and God and Moses asked God, Lord, if, if the uh, people ask me what your name is, what do I say? And God said, Romans 3, uh, uh, Exodus 3, 14, you tell them I am that I am has sent you. Well, that's what Jesus said. And look what happens after when he says that. And, and, and uh, he said, I am, in the verse 5. And Jesus, who betrayed him, was standing with them, with the enemy. And Jesus said, I am he. And they drew back and fell to the ground. It just, the, the presence of that of, of, of that supernatural saying of who he was just was so powerful it just blew him down just whoa. now some for some for some scholars who, who uh, some human scholars who, who think they're so smart and, and can explain everything and just assume that there's no miracles they assume hey what happened here they weren't blown down They were just standing too close uh, to one another, and, and it was dark, and somebody tripped, and they, the next guy tripped, and, they, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a disaster. But yeah, I see that. Well, yeah, that may be possible uh, if this wasn't the Roman army. They knew how to fight, and they're expecting a fight. 
and, and, and they're there in formation with weapons, with lanterns, torches, expecting them to have to find these people, and with weapons. They are ready for a battle. What happened here was God revealed supernaturally, he's not just here, this is Jesus, God. And when he did that, whoa, just blew him down. Well, here's what happens after that. And, and, and this is because, because uh, as awesome as that is, that's not the point. Here's the point of, I'm trying to make here. He says, and, um, and so verse, verse 7. And so he asked them again, whom do you seek? Because they stand back up and just, it just uh, didn't even phase them spiritually. It just shows you the blindness of sin. I mean, they don't even, it doesn't even make sense to them. And so, and so Jesus said, whom do you seek? This Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. And then and this was fulfilled, the, uh, the word that he had spoken of those whom you give me. Been, and then verse 10, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck at the high priest's servant and, and cut off his right ear. And, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, these, and, these, and the uh, servant's name was uh, Malchus. And Jesus, uh, after that, Jesus said to uh, Peter, Put your sword in your sheath. Uh, shall I not drink of the cup that the Father has, has given me? Now, now what, what, uh, um, what you see here is that Peter, what Peter has is supernatural courage. I mean, here's the image. Uh, you got Jesus here, disciples back here, 600 Roman soldiers and all these people to arrest him, armed, ready for a battle. And Peter thinks, hey, I'm taking my little sword and actually, the a word in the Greek is, 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 I mean, the English is sword. It's not really a big, long, honking sword. It's, it's a little sword for a, a, a Jim Bowie knife, that kind of thing. That's all he had. But he thinks, hey, Jesus and me is enough. And there's enough here. We can take on 600 of these Roman swords, just me and my little sword and Jesus. He had to be thinking, you know what, if I get... In trouble, all I got to do is say, Jesus, hey, say those words again, and just, and, and just blow them down again. <laughs> but, but what was that? Supernatural courage. I mean, just the courage of a man who, like Paul says, hey, I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. It's, it, it, it's Paul says, hey, I mean, to live, it, uh, to live is Christ. Hey, to die is gain. It, it don't matter what you... Do to Paul, he is going onward and forward. Why? Because there's something supernatural in him. That's the point. Well, right after this, and, and, and obviously, look at, at um, well, right after this is the whole story of, 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 of Peter. Um, he denies Christ. He's, I mean, after all this stuff, and, and this John 18 deal, happens right before he actually denies he even knows Jesus. And just now, now at the end in Acts, and we're going to get there in just a minute. In Acts, there, uh, uh, the Spirit kind of comes, and, and some supernatural things start happening. But before that, Peter now after saying supernatural things, doing supernatural things, and having supernatural courage, all of a sudden, he follows Jesus as he's arrested on trial for his life. He's standing outside in the fortress of uh, Antonio, and, 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 and a servant girl asks him, why don't you a follower of this man? He says, no, I don't know. Three times he denies he even knows Jesus Christ. But what happened to him? Where is all that supernatural thing? Well, most scholars believe the reason he did all those supernatural things is because Jesus is right there. And now he's been separated from Jesus. Jesus is on the inside. He's on the outside. And it actually says in, 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 in Matthew, he's actually standing, warming his hands with the enemy, basically, where God never actually wanted him to be. But in fact, look at this real quick. Look at Luke 22. Because it's, uh, uh, I think it's, it's uh, which, uh, this may be a, a little side note here of um, how, how 
can a good, godly man who knows Jesus Christ end up where a God never wanted him to be? How does a man who, who can stand up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ end up being sexually untrue to his wife, have, have, an adult, have an affair, and, and, and ends up losing it all? How does just a, a King David, a man after God's own heart, all of a sudden do the unthinkable and then has, has, commits adultery and then his most faithful servant, his, the soldier guy, who, who is so faithful, so good, so honorable, and he actually plots his own death just to come. How does that happen? Well, uh, we might see a little something in, in here uh, uh, about, um, about, uh, about uh, what happened to, to Peter after he did all these supernatural things and before he ends up denying he knows Christ. Here's one thing he does. Look at verse, verse 31 of, uh, of uh, Luke 22. Uh, Jesus and Simon are talking. And he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But Simon, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, I strengthen your brothers. But Peter said in verse 33, here's, here's a warning. And Jesus gave him, hey, you better be careful, son. You know why? Satan wants you. That's true of all of us. He, he wants all of us. And, and he says, he, he uh, wants to sift you like wheat. Here's Peter's response, verse 33. But Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to, uh, to, um, to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. You know, in Matthew 26, I'll go over uh, Matthew 26 real quick. Hurry. Matthew 26. Same story, same experience, but, but, but it just, it, just, it, it uh, shows an interesting little thing. Because obviously what Peter is uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, guilty of here just an overriding self-confidence. I mean, just a cockiness that, Lord, well, I'm not going to do this. Lord, I would never deny you. And, and, and it's just, we look at, at um, verse, uh, verse, um, verse 31 of Matthew 26. Now, stay with me. We're going to take a break in just a minute, although I'm way behind in, in where I'm supposed to be at this point in the thing. But he, here's what he says. And then Jesus said to all of them, all of the disciples, hey, you will all fall away from me because of me this night. You will all fall away. All of you are going to run. And, 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 and he says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter answered and said this, though they all fall away because you, I will never fall away. All these other guys may fall, but I'm not going to fall. They may be weak. I'm not weak. It may get them, but you know, this stuff will not get me. I will be faithful all the way to the end. Here's what Jesus said after that. After that, Jesus said to him, now Jesus is going to correct Peter and say this. He says, but, but uh, Peter says, in verse 34, Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, to Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now, obviously, if God says something, going to happen, right? Well, uh, 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 Jesus just, uh, 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 just told Peter in his cocky moment, Lord, all these other guys are going to fall away, but I'm not going to fall away. Jesus looked at him and said, son, before this night is over, you will deny me three times. And then Peter said, look at this, verse 35, even I must die with you, I will not deny you and all this. I be, uh, uh, you know what he's doing? And this is unbelievable. He's so cocky. In his strength, he's, he's arguing with Jesus. He's saying, Jesus said this is going to happen. Jesus said, no, it's not. I can handle it. You know what? That's pride. That's arrogant. That's a confidence thing. You know what? I don't need the word of the Lord. I can handle this on my own. You know what? The fact is, if King David, a man of God's own heart, 
was just stated about him before his sin and even after his sin in the New Testament makes it seem about him. If he's guilty, if he's capable of blowing, you know what? Every one of us men are capable of blowing this thing. It's just living instead of, 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 of passionately pursuing Jesus Christ intimately, now personally and, and powerfully and asking him to supernaturally work in my life and through my life. The opposite of that is just living kind of cocky, arrogant, and thinking, you know what? I would never do this. I, 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 I remember this story, Gordon McDonald. You know Gordon McDonald. He's a great a preacher, writer with some great books. Uh, years ago, uh, Billy Beecham, who was a youth guy, who I knew well, Gordon McDonald is speaking in a conference of youth guys. I was at the conference. I went, I went, but, but, but Billy was Gordon's driver. And they drove, you know, he drove them all over the place, all of his different speaks and things. And, 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 and there was a conversation. Billy said, Gordon said to him, and they were discussing and talking about life and ministry and so forth and so on. Gordon said, you know, I may blow it in many ways, but when I'm not going to blow it, I'm not going to be unfaithful to my wife. A year later, he's unfaithful to his wife. I mean, it's a cocky. I mean, you think you can? Yes, you can. And, and, and what Peter is guilty of, it's just, it's just a cocky arrogance. Like, what's the second thing? He, he's, he's maybe uh, guilty of. Look at verse, uh, where am I? Oh, uh, Luke 22 again. Look back at Luke. Um, Luke, 20, Luke uh, 22. Here's, here's a, now I'm... I'm a little bit off my point, but, but, um, but um, it's in there. It's in the vicinity, you know what I mean? But, uh, but um, here's the second thing that got him off track. <laughs> the first is, um, is he was just cocky, just kind of arrogant. You know what? One thing... It's not a bad thing at all if the first thing a man does when he gets out of bed is falls on his knees. Just a reminder to him and to everybody, God, I know how much I need you this day. God, I don't want to blow it. I want to honor you. I want to glorify you. Everything I do, just I, that's, that's why I need you desperately in my life. Well, he was, here's the second thing. He, he, um, he, was, he was lax in his prayer. Uh, here's a, look at this. Uh, in Matthew, Matthew 39 of Luke 22. And they, uh, this is right after he said about the, um, about the, uh, uh, he, said, he said, I won't deny. And Jesus said, yes, you will. And, and, and um, at the Mount of Olives, in the Sabbath fall, verse 40, and he, and, and, he, and he comes through this place and, and he says, pray, pray, here's what he says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, that's a great word, isn't it? So Jesus knows that you you are going into some temptation. What you got to do is you got to pray that you will not enter into temptation, that he will not lead you into this thing. And if you get in this thing, um, you have victory over this thing. But what does Peter do? He sleeps. And, 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 and here's what happened in verse 41. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, kneels down and prays, saying, this is Jesus. Father, if you're willing to move this cup from me, nevertheless, I'm willing to be done. And an angel from heaven came and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling on the ground. All that agony, all that sorrow, all that prayer. And when he rose from his prayer, he comes to his disciples and found them sleeping for, uh, uh, for sorrow. And he said, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. He just may have been a little bit lax in his prayer life. Then the third thing, I think he does. The um, that story I just told you about his courage, which was amazing courage. You know, all the story he gets a sword, he goes and tells us that. Well, look at Luke in in verse because uh, in verse forty seven, uh, Luke tells that story, and then and then in verse forty nine, and when those around him saw that um, um, he just betrayed, they said. Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and, and cut off his. That's Peter. He did that. And then, and then, and then, uh, and then next verse. Jesus said, uh, he says, and what does he say? No more of this. What may have happened there? Peter is acting in his own strength. He's taking the whole thing in his own deal. What does he do? He, he's there. He said, now, Jesus, God's plan is for him to be crucified. God's plan is 
Yeah. And God is orchestrating this whole thing. These army, this Romans to be there. All this is God's plan. And what Peter does, true, he shows great courage, but he's acting in the flesh, takes his thing, and he goes, you know, I'm going to handle this thing. There are too many men. We are strong physically. We're able. We can handle it. You know what we do? We just get in there and say, I'm going to fix this thing. When maybe if we try to fix something, fix a wife, fix, fix a kid, fix a situation, you know, all we do is just break the thing beyond repair. You know what? It's not acting in our strength. It's acting in his strength, according to his will, his plan, his time. Well, Peter did all that stuff, and as a result, he denied he even knew Jesus. And it says he leaves. In fact, Luke says, Luke, Luke 22 also says, he, 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 uh, he denies Christ. And, and on that third time, he hears the, the rooster crow. He remembers the word of the Lord, the Bible says, what Jesus said, and all of a sudden he turned, and it says in a magical moment, it says Jesus, and, and, and Peter's eyes looked, and, 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 and Jesus looked at him and said. Now, now, just an awesome, I thought about that, that, that I just realized it, uh, this a few weeks ago, uh, about this whole story. You know what's awesome about it? Uh, because there's a whole lot. Of awesome things in this whole deal. But you know, one awesome thought in this whole thing. Jesus knew Peter was going to fail. He knew it. And his prayer was in Luke, Luke 22 uh, that after you have turned again, after you've repented of this sin and returned back to me, your faith will not fail. You're going to fail, but your faith's not going to fail. And in the end, you're going to use what I do in your life to strengthen the brothers. And you know what? He did that exact same thing uh, later on. But, 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 uh, but uh, here's my point. He knew, he knew Peter was going to sin. You know what? He knows I'm going to sin. Now, obviously, I don't have to sin. You don't have to. We don't have to say no to anything. But uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say I have said yes to some things I shouldn't say yes to and done some things I shouldn't have done. Sin. But Jesus knew that already. And he's already got a plan in place to restore me, to forgive me, to restore me, just like Peter. And on the other side, use me in an incredible supernatural way. Just like he did Peter. Peter, you're going to fail. But you know what? I'm going to work in this thing. You're going to confess. He wept bitterly. I'm going to forgive you and cleanse you. And on the other side, I'm going to do some incredible things in your life. That's an awesome thought, which basically says this. You know what I mean? He loves you. Many men think God doesn't love me now because I've, made, I've done this uh, awful thing in my life. Well, the fact is, he loved you before, and he knew you were going to do that. That does not change his love for you. Uh, it changes what he wants. So, so uh, here's the end result. All this happens. Of course, Peter is, is uh, of course, well, gosh, I'm, I'm so behind. But, but, but look real quick at John, John uh, 21. We're going to get the end of, of where I wanted to go. John 21. Real quick. Because, because um, uh, John, John 21, after, after his failure, uh, after he blows it, and, and, and Jesus is crucified, you know, he dies, he's buried, and then he, 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 he arises again, he's alive, the resurrection happens, and it says in... in in Luke, in a little verse, I, I came here, it's 24 someplace in there, but the little book says, says and that um, all the Christians are saying, hey, uh, uh, they're all saying, the Lord has arisen and he's appeared to Simon. Jesus uh, knew before, Peter, you're going to blow it, but I prayed for you. He's always praying for us. Uh, he always lifts and makes intercession for us as he before he was seven and uh, he's praying for us but he said I've prayed for you and when you when you when you turn, turn again strengthen the brothers here's what happens and he wants to meet Peter so in John 21 they meet and and, and this is this is fascinating because uh, I don't have time to go through all this but but you know three times uh, Peter I mean uh, Jesus asked Peter do you love me do you love me do you love me? And, and Peter says, yes, Lord. First time, yes, you know I, I love you. And feed my lambs. He said the second time, do you love me? He says, yes, tend my sheep, he says. 
And then he says, uh, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Three times, three denials, three times he says that thing. And what's awesome about that is, uh, Jesus is saying to Peter, uh, Peter, you have blown it, but uh, uh, you've confessed your sin. I've forgiven of your sin. Now I want to take you. You're going to strengthen your brothers, and I'm going to do a supernatural thing in you, and I'm going to use you to actually be a shepherd of my sheep. You know what's awesome? Uh, it is awesome that a man can experience the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, is that awesome? You know what may be even more awesome than that? Now, I get to be one, at, uh, even of all the bad stuff I've done, I've experienced his forgiveness, but now I get to be the one who gets to share that forgiveness with others and tell people, you can be forgiven. They say, how do you know? I was forgiven. And not only that, even though I've blown it, he's prayed for me to restore me, and the end result is I can be one of the shepherds who shepherds his flock. Now you say, I'm not a preacher. Hey, you got a family. You got an extended family. You got a sphere of influence. All of those people God wants you, you to say, no, they're in my flock. I'm responsible for these people. That's so why I'm going to love them. I'm going to share with them. I'm going to them. I'm going to disciple them. I'm going to witness them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, all these things. Well, Peter does that. Has, and, and, and you know what? Peter wants to have a meeting with, I mean, Jesus wants to have a meeting with Peter. Man, the bottom line is God wants to have a meeting with you. Get some things right in your life. Deal with some things and start doing some super sense. So, uh, uh, in conclusion, here's what happens. Acts chapter 2, real quick. I, 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 I can't look at all these things, but, uh, but um, two more minutes, I'm done, okay? But Acts chapter 2, you know what happens in Acts chapter 2? No, obviously, uh, Jesus has, has, has been dying, crucified, buried. He's, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's gone. And, but he said, hey, I'm going to send someone else. Not exactly uh, the same type as I am, but me, but just another form. Um, and of course, it's the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, that's what happens. Holy Spirit comes. Now, God is not just manifest in, in the person of the Son, the Lord Jesus, in a human body right beside Peter. Now, God has manifested himself through his Holy Spirit inside Peter. So now it's not just Peter looking and saying, there's Jesus. I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to say stuff. I'm going to do stuff. Now that Jesus is in Peter. So in Acts 2, what happens? Peter stands up and preaches a message. And when he preaches the message, 3,000 people, maybe a bunch more than that, accept Jesus Christ as Savior and get changed, saved, and the church is formed right then. Now what is that? He's saying something supernatural again. You know, just, just he stands up. You ought to, uh, the sermon's in, in, in text. Uh, uh, you can read what he says. I mean, all he does is preaches Jesus and him crucified. No funny stories, no illustrations, no, no I mean, it's just, just the gospel. But he preaches, and you know what? 3,000 say, yes, I'm going to be saved. You know, that's like, you know, Billy Graham was just famous for preaching just the simplest sermons. In fact, you know what the fact is? No preachers preach Billy Graham sermons. You know what? They're too simple. There's, there's nothing really there, humanly speaking, except the Word of God. Except Jesus died for you. You're a sinner. You need to be saved. But you know what? Every time he stood up and preached that simple message that presented the gospel, and every invitation he ever gave is almost the exact same verbiage every single time. But when he does it, it's a supernatural. It isn't just Billy Graham saying stuff. It is God speaking through Billy Graham, and something supernatural happens from what he's saying. That's the first thing. He, he's saying supernatural things. And then, and then three, Acts 3, he's on the way. He and, he and uh, um, Peter and John are on the way uh, to the temple, and, um, and uh, there's, a, there's a man lame from birth, being carried at the beautiful gate, take homes. And the man, seeing Peter and John, verse 3, uh, uh, about to go into the temple, asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, and the man, and, 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 and he wants alms. And so um, 
Now, Peter says, now look at us. And he fixed his eye, his, his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, verse 6, I have no silver or gold. Uh, old King James said, uh, uh, Old King now James said, Silver and gold I don't have. But such as I have, I give unto you. And, and then he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. You know what happens? The guy stands up and walks. What is that? He's doing some supernatural again. God is showing up in his life, and some supernatural is happening. And then Acts, Acts, Acts uh, chapter 4. Peter and John are arrested. And they're actually standing and before the exact same group, the Sanhedrin, uh, 70 Jewish scholars, all dressed in black, in this room, they're all standing up there. This is the same group who condemned Jesus to death. Of course, they couldn't crucify him. They had to have the Romans involved in this, but they're the ones who started the process. Now, Peter is standing before the exact same group who had Jesus died, uh, 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 killed, who could do the same to him. They challenge him, this same guy who uh, said, who a, a servant girl challenged him, and he, could, and, and he couldn't stand up. But now, this time, with his life on the line, he stands up, and here's what he says. Uh, he stands up, and, and then Peter, verse 8, then, uh, of Acts chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the point, said to them, rulers of the uh, people and elders, if we're being examined exam today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by one means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, he says, I love this, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you. And this Jesus, he says, is the stone which was re rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there's, there's a self Salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What is that? Supernatural courage. It's back. Why? Because Jesus is in him, and he is now walking in the active, manifest presence of God. Now, what we're going to do in the uh, next, next uh, session is just... Uh, because obviously everybody, you'll hear stuff like that, you know, supernatural stuff. And, and, and uh, some guys start thinking, hey, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start healing the sick and uh, raising the dead and, and uh, give me a bus and, and me do crusades and make a lot of money and get on TV and all that stuff. Well, that can happen. But, but uh, how about just some more practical things? There are some a man starts loving his, his wife supernaturally. The way Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Whole another way to live. Whole another way to do it. Every woman in the universe who's ever lived has always wanted to be loved with that kind of love. And the fact is, I don't want to just love Sheila which as much as, as I as a man can love her. I want to love her the way God can love a woman through a man. That's, that, that's the idea. So we're going to hit this next section. Let me pray. We'll pray. God, we do thank you for uh, just your word and that speaks for your spirit that opens our eyes and helps us to see what we need to see and, and, and uh, help us to hear what we need to hear. And God, uh, may you speak and may your will be done in our lives. That's our prayer. Uh, in Jesus' name. <coughs> Thanks. I saw him late. <laughs> I had to go uh, to the Cito El Baño. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to just just uh, show um, just a a couple more uh, examples of that supernatural thing happening. Look at Acts Acts um, chapter seven. Just, just some things in the Bible uh, before we look at, at uh, some practical things in my life and your life. Uh, Acts 7, this is where, uh, I think it's Acts 7. This is where, uh, uh, Acts, yes, end of Acts uh, 7, where Stephen is being st stoned. Yeah. Uh, a stone to death. I mean, being being 
he preached, uh, uh, he's been preaching, and, and they're going to take up stones and throw it at him until he dies. In fact, look down at, at the uh, 58 of Acts 7. And, and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, who ends up being Paul. And as they were stoning Stephen, Stephen called out and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That is, it is what? Two things. Supernatural forgiveness and supernatural peace. How can you forgive somebody like that? The, the point, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did at the cross. He's being crucified. And he said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Now Jesus and, and Stephen, Stephen is able to do the exact same thing. He's forgiven the way no man, because he's being stoned. Uh, uh, these guys are throwing rocks at him. Now, uh, I play baseball. You play baseball. And, and uh, you know it's like you're standing there at the thing, and the guy throws that, and then he hits you. Things that hurts, that leaves a mark, and you, you know, uh, you don't show it, obviously, on the, on the field because you're not that cool, but, but you run the first place, and I'm just killing you. Well, just imagine having a bunch of guys throwing at you, and, and you're hitting, and hitting here, or hitting, and all of a sudden you're bleeding, and all of a sudden I'm stunned and cut, and all of a sudden they keep going until you're dead. About as bad as it can get. But in the midst of that, what he had, he had a peace. And he even looked unto heaven and, and said, basically, he didn't whine, he didn't cry, he didn't cry. You know, he just says, he, just like he's in his mama's arms, he just falls asleep. That's what he says. And he also supernaturally forgives. You know what? One of the things that robs so many human beings of life and joy meaningfully is the fact that they've been wronged by somebody and they, and they cannot forgive. Or they are unable to forgive themselves what they've done in their life, sin, even though they know Jesus has died for them and forgave them. But they can't do it. Well, what this is is a supernatural forgiveness. Yeah. That just is, is able to forgive. And, 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 and of course, everyone says, well, we all aren't worthy of forgiveness. Well, humanly speaking, you can't forgive somebody who's unworthy to be forgiven. Supernaturally, though, you can. Because it's a supernatural a miraculous thing. Look at Acts 16 real quick. Acts 16. Acts 16 is where, is where Paul and Silas are uh, been preaching. They get arrested. They're, they're uh, been beaten. They've been dragged uh, and been beaten. Then they live through their life. Who are now in prison, middle of the night, having been literally beaten to the inch of their life. They're, they're uh, uh, in the pit of this uh, jail, in the bottom of it, uh, uh, in, just, in just a miserable circumstance. Uh, humanly speaking, it's about as miserable a situation as you can get. All they're going to do is serve Jesus. All they're going to do is final Jesus. All they're going to do is preach the word of God. And, and they've been, been arrested and beaten and, and everything. And all the human circumstances seem to be against them. So what do you do? A human is being mad. If you complain, why? God, all I want to do is, is honor you and, and you let all this bad stuff. Why has this happened to me? That's the human response. Here's the supernatural response. Here's what, what when, when God manifests himself supernaturally in a man's life, here's what happens. And, and, and it says about midnight, verse 25 of Acts 16. Paul and Silas, where they are, remember, and what happened to them, aren't whining and complaining. What are they doing? They're praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners are listening to them. You know what the end of this thing? This, 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 uh, this uh, jailer is going to show up after the uh, earthquake happens and, 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 and everybody's free, chains are off, the doors are open, and, and he said, well, say you be saved. He said, you can pay me the house. And, 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 and all of them are saved in this thing. Why? These people, these other prisoners, were listening to Paul and Silas and thinking, Man, I'm in here too. I'm not praising. I'm suffering. I'm not singing praises to God. And, 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 and they think, 
Well, what's up with these guys? And what these guys had was supernatural joy. Mm -hmm. That's a joy not tied to circumstances, to my salary, to my career, to my stuff, to my health. It's a supernatural joy found in the joy of the Lord, who is our strength. Because the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is our strength. And, and we just find that so Here's one more that I want you to see, just Acts 14. Because I'm sure there's much more, but just in some time. Acts 14. He, uh, they, uh, in verse, uh, Acts, uh, Acts 14, 19. And, and the Jews um, came from Antioch. Now, Paul is preaching. He's on a preaching uh, 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 tour. He's going around preaching to everybody. And he is preaching salvation in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's faith in him by grace. You don't have to do anything. There's a bunch of Jews who are kind of mad at him because all these Jews who are following him in all these places want uh, Christians, uh, Gentiles who are being saved, to be a Jew. <coughs> So they're mad at Paul. They're following Paul. And the thing, here's what happens in verse 15. And, but Jews, uh, these Jews who were mad at him, came from Antioch and uh, Iconium, having persuaded the crowds, and they stoned Paul. The same deal. Took stone, stone. And it says this. Uh, they dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. Now these Jews, you know, their, their form of uh, capital punishment for stoning Paul is what they did. So obviously... These guys had 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 done this before, right? They're experts at it. And yeah, yeah, experts at it. And you would think they knew if they stoned the guy, and they all walked up around him and looked at him, they would. It's about I always know if he's dead or not, right? I mean, if it's bad enough, he's dead. It, I'm assuming if they got up to it, it wasn't bad enough. That would would uh, take one more rock and blow to make sure he was dead. You know what I'm saying? But, but it says here, they stoned him, dragged him out. And they thought he was dead. So obviously it was a bad, a, he was in a bad way, right? I mean, it wasn't just a headache. I mean, uh, it was bad enough. He's on the ground, bleeding, obviously uncommon, all that stuff. And all the Jews come out and they look at him and they uh, 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 maybe kicked him and talked to him and everything. And said, they said, yeah, he's dead. And it says that they left him supposing he was dead, what the Bible actually says. Here's what happens. And this is amazing. Verse 20. When the disciples gathered about him, he rose up, entered the city, and on the next day, the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby, where they had preached the gospel of that city, and many of the disciples said, he just, here's the point, here's what he did. He just had a stone with the ends of his life. <coughs> and the next day, he gets up, what he, he gets, he, he, he goes, uh, he doesn't even take a day off. He didn't even sleep in. The next day, he says, I, I've got to preach in, Dur in Derby as well. And he goes and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is that? That's a supernatural keep it on, keep it on. It just, hey, I will not take no for an answer. Hey, it don't matter what you do to me. You can stop me here, but the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ and his gospel. You know, and I'm, I'm coming back no matter what you do to me. That you will not give in, will not give up. You know, it's a supernaturalness about a man who just knows Jesus Christ and it shows through his life and shows through his faith. And, and it's the fact that he believes. And you know what? He believes in a great God. And when, in fact, in fact it, um, let's do this. I want you to just give me an example of, of, uh, of this in my life. Look at Matthew. Of course, we looked at this earlier. In, in the, I'm not going to look at this. Well, wow. we may do this whole passage. But Matthew 14. And, and uh, this just just uh, how God um, pulled to this deal. Uh, first, first, Matthew fourteen twenty two. Um, and, and, and let me just read this because because uh, I want you to see how this in, in experience was powerfully manifested and displayed in my life. He said this immediately. He, or Jesus, made the disciples get on the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When he came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from the way, land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against him. And on the fourth watch of the night, about three o'clock in the morning, he comes to them walking on the sea, on the water. It's a miracle. Now, you remember? That's a supernatural. He's walking on the water. And 
Um, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out from fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. I'm reminded of that a lot. In situations where I am, and I, uh, I can get spooked. You know, I mean, I, I mean that's, uh, that's uh, you know, men aren't supposed to get spooked, but, uh, but uh, 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 I can get spooked. You know what's spooky sometimes is is a church late at night. <laughs> You're the only one there. I've had experience of, of being in our church, big church, on the elevator. I mean, it's dark. You know, all the emergency lights are on, the only thing on, there's kind of shadows and things like that. And being, out the, being in an elevator on the first floor, on the third floor, and you're in the hit the button, you're going, and all of a sudden you think, you know, these doors are going to open. And I have no idea what's going to be on this side. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a boogeyman or something, or some bad guy, or something. <laughs> Somebody's going to open the door. And so the, the, the door's going to be thinking, oh, I have no idea. It's just amazing how often I think, hey, uh, I'm not supposed to be afraid. Because no. God is not, not giving us fear, fear of the power of the same way. It just reminds me, hey, uh, why should I not be afraid? Because you know what I am. Yes. It is I, he says. I am here. Therefore, you don't be afraid. And then he says this. And Peter answers, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the wall. He's asking for the impossible. He's asking what, what men cannot do. He's asking, Lord, I see you have to do it. Lord, I want to be where you are. I want to come to you. And Lord, if it's you out there, let me come to you. He's asking for the impossible. He's asking for the supernatural. And what's amazing about him asking for the supernatural is, is what's even more <coughs> amazing than Peter asking for the supernatural, it's, it, it's even more uh, amazing how Jesus responds to his impossible supernatural request. Because Jesus doesn't say, no, you can't do this. This is God's stuff. Hey, this is men don't do this stuff. He didn't say that. Peter wants to experience the supernatural. He asked, Lord, let me come to. And all Jesus said was, Come. And if you got the faith, step out of that boat and stick a foot on the water. You come, and you're going to find out not what a man can do. You're going to find out what God can do in a man. Supernatural. Supernatural manifestation of Almighty God in a man's life. Too. And, and sure enough, that's what he does in verse 29. So he gets out of the boat, walks on the water, and comes to Jesus. When he saw him, he was afraid, he takes his eyes off Jesus, he starts to sink, he starts to all that stuff. And he cries out, he cries out and says, Lord, save me. He, he, saved, he, would have, he would have drowned, he would have died. He said, Well, save me. But Jesus immediately reached out, took hold of his hand, saying to him, Well, you will die. Why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And those of the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. You know, just, just a, a miracle happened here when Peter decided, when, when Peter decided, I'm getting out of here. Here's got 12 guys uh, uh, in the boat. 11 guys did not get out of the boat. One guy did. 11 guys did not experience the supernatural power of God working in their life and a miracle happened. One guy did. The reason was God, but because of Peter, he got out of the boat. When, when a man decided, I, I said, you know what, I'm going to stop living my life according to what, just according to what I can see, just according to what I can understand. Just according to what I can explain. There's a whole lot of things I can't explain. A whole lot of things I don't understand. You know, a whole, whole things of faith. I don't understand all these things about faith. I don't understand all things about God. I don't understand a whole lot of things I don't understand. But you know what? Everybody's in that boat. Mm -hmm. Every man who's alive today thinks he's got it all together. There's something he don't know. He's believing. Uh, he is trusting in, in Muhammad me. Well, well, that's a faith issue you all show. He, he didn't have all the answers either. Uh, about life and about stuff. Or he's believing in himself. He didn't have all the answers. None of us have all. It's all faith in something. Now Peter decided, you know what? I'm believing in Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm getting out of the boat and I'm going to him. But a man decides, I'm going to get outside of myself in my little comfort zone, in my little deal, and start living not just to what a, a 
according to, I can understand and explain. And, and, and you know, if a man how truly lived his life, the way he, he, he treats Jesus, because there's some men say, you know, I'm not going to follow Jesus, but because all this stuff, I, 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 I can't explain about election or predestination or, you know, the sovereignty of God or providence, or I don't understand about his, his sovereign will and my creator. I, I, don't understand all that. I don't understand all that. You know, if a man lived his life truly that same way in every other area of his life, He's not going to do things he doesn't understand. Uh, uh, you wouldn't use electricity because you don't understand electricity. Uh, 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 you wouldn't let a hard guy operate on your heart because you don't know a thing about that. We don't know so much unless we place our faith in a thousand things every day. Why can't we take a step and say, I'm getting out of my boat. And I'm stepping up by faith. I don't understand. I can't explain. But you know, I know Jesus is. God, and I know he wants to do something in my life, and I'm going to Jesus. When a man gets out of the boat, you know what can happen? Supernatural things can happen. No. Does it always happen? No. But it will not happen if I don't trust him. If I don't get out of the boat. It's like I tell my sports teams all the time. I'm going to talk to a high school team, and I'll make a statement like, uh, hey, uh, you got to believe! You gotta believe and be a champion. And of course, someone else says, Are you are you are you telling me if I believe and dream that I can be a state champion, I'm gonna be a state champion? Well no, obviously. Just because you believe and believe. But I guarantee you, if you don't believe it, you will not be a state champion. That's my point. Hey, I can't explain everything. Hey, I still struggle. I still have stuff. You know, some men kind of think, hey, if I get on my book, go to Jesus. It's not going to be any more struggles. It's going to be simple. Hey, a God had a choice. You know, he's got Moses. He's got Israel in bondage. He's got the promised land. God could have easily, simply worked in Moses, said, Moses, I'm taking you and the Israelites to the promise. That's his plan. It's going to happen. He's going to get there. And it could have been simple. Moses goes, says Pharaoh, Pharaoh, God says this. Pharaoh goes, ooh, God said, okay, you guys are out of here, go ahead. They go, they walk, no problem, no, no water, no nothing. They go, just a short distance from here to there. One of them goes, it's glorious. Uh, uh, he he uh, could have done that. Yeah. What happened was, God did a work in Moses' life. Moses goes to Pharaoh, and Moses said, Exodus 5, 1, Moses said, Pharaoh, the God of Israel, let my people go. Pharaoh responds with, Hey, I don't know your God, and no, I will not let his people go. So Moses said, Ooh, man, what's up with this? That's life. You know, the whole thing for Moses. Now, it got done. He got the job done. He got there. But it was a struggle the whole way. Ten plagues. All the stuff he went through. All the battles with Pharaoh. All that stuff. That's just the way it is. Life is a struggle. It's a pain. But you know what? It's a struggle... If I stay in my boat or get out of the boat, it's still a struggle. It's still painful. But you know, the end result is in the midst of the pain, I experience the presence of the living God. Amen. Amen. What happened? Supernatural things can't happen. I felt, I shared this, I think, last year, but I, I, uh, when I was a senior in high school, I felt like God was calling me to preach. But I couldn't talk. I couldn't say anything. But I like to say, I was such a good stutterer. I couldn't even say a silent prayer with that stuff. <laughs> I couldn't talk. But I'd be sitting in church, my senior in high school, uh, every Sunday, out there, invitation comes. A message comes. Man, I think he's speaking right to me. Invitation, I'm thinking, I need to go forward. I'm sure my life to the ministry, but I say, I can't, because it's stupid. You can't have me. There's no way I can talk. I'm at, as a senior in high school, I'm involved in a little... Uh, our, our youth choir singing group at, at uh, my trip. I'm going to leave with Kansas. Or a little bit, a small church, a little bit, maybe 20 high school kids in this group. We're singing one Sunday night, uh, doing a concert at Warnell Road uh, Baptist Church in downtown Kansas City. We we're singing up there, you know, doing a little thing. And about halfway through, our director, Larry J. Winter, was his name. Larry J. We called him. Larry J. stopped the concert and said, "You know what? These are outstanding students." <clears throat> I want you to meet these students. So he's, he looks at and says, uh, students, I want you to, uh, uh, each one of you, 
introduce yourself, say your name, what grade you're in, and we go to high school. Well, as soon as he said that, I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm going to make a fool of myself. It's going to be awful. Because every time I have spoken in um, public, it was, it, was, uh, it was a disaster. Well, it comes to me, and I'm trying to say, I'm Neil Jeffrey. I'm a senior at Shawnee Mission South High School. Nothing ever comes out. I mean, I'm going to major block. I'm just stuck. I'm stuttering extremely well. Of course, as soon as you get stuck in a situation like that, and, and uh, 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 you feel all this pressure, everybody's staring at you. Yeah. I mean, uh, you panic. This means uh, 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 you tighten up even more. And I'm in severe stuff. Well, I can, I can feel the embarrassment of all my friends in the car. And I can feel it. And I can see the horrified look on, on everybody in the church. And finally, after what seemed to be a forever, Larry J., our director, uh, interrupted me, although technically it was not an interruption. <laughs> but he interjected on my behalf and he said, that's Neil Jeffrey. He's a senior at Shiny Mr. South High School. One of the most humiliating experiences of my whole life. I feel so stupid. I felt so inadequate. I feel that there's no way God can use There's not going to be a place for me in this time. Well, the, uh, I'm struggling. Well, the next year, I'm in a festival in Baylor, and Bob and Fellowship of Christian Athens, we had a huge FCA group. All of the old established companies, we had an FCA group, I think, in Texas back then. But, but uh, FCA nationally had a weekend of champions in in Lubbock, Texas, on the Tech campus. So uh, FCA moves from all over America with college athletes, pro athletes, coach, everybody was there that weekend. We get there, hope oh, of us, uh, we drive out there, get there on Friday night in the hotel where we're staying. And uh, there's this big board and have all the college athletes' names on it and, and uh, uh, all the conference schools. And everybody had a Saturday assignment, working with high school kids and, and, and uh, how to work with everything. And then everybody had a Sunday assignment. And the Sunday assignment was every college athlete on pro, FCA had an athlete, um, a coach, give a testimony in every church in the whole city of Lubbock on that Sunday. It was pretty awesome. Well, I found my name, saw my Saturday assignment, and then saw my Sunday assignment, and saw that somebody had obviously made a mistake and assigned me a trip to give a testimony on that Sunday. I'm thinking, no way, I gotta get out of this, I can't So I, I essentially spent all weekend Trying to get out of this thing. Well, good. There's, there's, there's a, no way I can do it. Well, I can't. If I finally shows up, it's Sunday morning. I'm at the church. It's going to happen. I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a disaster. I'm sitting in the front row, just sick, cotton mouth. I'm thinking it's going to be. I remember asking God, asking Him to uh, assist me to stop this thing. Do something. Just, just. Just send a tornado or, <laughs> or blow the sound system. Just do something. Because uh, it's going to be awful. Well, I get uh, introduced. I stand up, open my mouth. And for the first time in my life, I spoke five, six, seven minutes without a stutter. I mean, it just rolled off my tongue. No tension in, in my chest and vocal cords. I mean, it just... Fluid speech. I had never felt fluid speech. In fact, I remember thinking as I was speaking, thinking to myself, who is this? Because <laughs> I had never felt that kind of speech. In fact, to be honest, I've, I have, have probably not spoken that fluidly since that morning back in 1972. But after I sat down, I had not discovered how great Neil Jeffrey was, because I know Neil Jeffrey can't. I had just discovered how great God is. Amen. Amen. And he can do anything with anybody if he just gets out of the boat and trusts him to do something supernatural in my life. Now, you know, I'm asked the, the, the question all the time. Well, if God did it then, why didn't he just keep on doing it? Why can't he speak to you your life? 
I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. I pray. I've had some men who, who, who get all on me. I've been anointed. They put their hands on me. They prayed. Some guys have said, Neil, it's your faith. You don't have enough faith. Some guys have said other stuff. I don't have an answer for that. But you know, Paul asked God. He had a thorn three times. He said, Lord, take this away. God never took the thorn away. But ultimately, he did his miracle in and through that thorn. Yes. <coughs> because his, his, in his weakness, God says, my power is made perfect. Yeah. But the point is, I experience the power of God in my life. That's what he wants to do in our life. Now, does it always happen? No. But it does. It can. It will. Also, you know what else happens in the story? A miracle happened. He walked on water. You know the second thing is? He started to drown. And, and Peter got touched by Jesus. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Jesus touched him, saved his life, pulled him out of the water. He got touched. Every person who got touched by Jesus Christ or who touched Jesus was never the same again. That's right. I mean, do you realize this whole this whole uh, Christianity thing is not just joining a church, it's just not walking down an aisle. You know what ultimately is? It's being touched by the Holy Christ. Come on. Amen. My life Amen. changes everything. Makes everything new, alive. Past forgiven, sins are cleansed. And all of a sudden something new. You know We, I guess we need to be touched by Jesus in my life and in, in my marriage and my family to experience his touch. It's a powerful thing. You know, once you've been touched by Jesus, you start to experience, because one, he's Lord. But two, you start, you start discovering, you know what? Jesus is, is, uh, he's enough. He's all I need. Mm -hmm. I've discovered, you know what? I thought I needed all this other stuff. Okay, but I need is Jesus. And knowing Jesus just gives meaning to all this other stuff. Keeps all this stuff in perspective. It gives all this stuff meaning. So things to taste out there actually have taste to it because I'm living my life not according to, to that, but according to Jesus, which enlightens everything around me. I was coming to my dad, who uh, I'm going to share about in just a moment ago, but my dad was, uh, uh, he died with um, pancreatic cancer. And the last year of his life, you know, he struggled, he had that, that surgery and all that stuff. And, it was hard, it was tough, but uh, my dad said this a thousand times. I heard him say this. He'd say, you know, preachers use this, this line. I've heard this, he's a kind of preacher, but uh, uh, my dad uses it as well. He said, Neil, all my Christian life, I've always believed Jesus is all you need. Now, I realize facing death, Jesus is all I have. I got nothing else but Jesus. And you know what? Now, being in my situation I'm in, knowing that all I have is Jesus, I really have discovered Jesus really is all I need. It's enough. You know, you experience this touch in your life. All of a sudden, it feels life all of a sudden takes on a whole new dimension. Yes. Supernatural. You got touched. You know what else? It's, and this is also awesome. at the end. It says, uh, verse 32, after all that stuff, the miracle gets touched. And now they get back in the boat. The winds stop, the winds see, storms over, seas calm. And those in the boat, it says, worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Now, it says, actually, all of them are worshiping Jesus. Everyone in the boat, all because remember, there are 12 in the boat, Jesus on the water. He gets out of the boat, he goes, does the miracle, starts to sing, takes his eyes off, starts to sing, Jesus picks him up. Now, all of them in the boat, they're all in the boat, they're all worshiping. They're all singing the songs, they're all saying, You're the Son of God. But you know what? I just imagine one guy is worshiping in a dimension and a level, and a level that the other 11 have no idea. Yes, amen. Because 11 watched the miracle, Peter lived the miracle. Eleven watched a man get touched by the living Christ. Jesus felt the touch of the living Christ. Changes how a man even worships. Why? Because he's experienced the living Christ in his life. And supernatural things happen. You know what? I, I'm still 
I am blown away that I am the one with all my struggles in my life, all my inadequacies, all my stuff, all my dysfunctions, all, all the stuff in my life, it blows me away that I'm the one standing up here speaking this week. I'm the one that preaches. That says very little about me. It says an awful lot about God, about who He is, what He can do, supernatural things in a man's life and through a man's life. So a man lives in a whole new dimension that, that, that the carnal, normal, natural man has no idea about. Now, as I said, of course, everybody hears all that, wants to do all these things, but you know what? It, 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 it may be just as simple a thing as a man, as Paul did, said, hey, I'm going to keep it on, keep it on. I believe. You know, I'm going to keep on believing. I'm not giving up. I'm not I'm backing down. I'm not throwing in the towel. I'm staying in this thing all the way to the end. Because in our world, the easiest thing in the world for too many men uh, 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 just to quit. Yeah. Just to throw in the towel. Say, I'm not, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. Just kind of kind of walk away. It, it's kind of deep thing. It's just, just but we don't have a man who believes. A man, he goes, Jesus, just as Paul did. When he got knocked down and beaten all his life, next day he's up, he's going. Why? Well, hey, I've discovered some things by my faith in Jesus Christ. I've found a hill that you know, I'm dying right here. I'm, I'm, I'm building my tent. I'm, I'm getting my stakes down. You know what? If I'm dying, I'm dying right here because this is what I believe. And I'm going to keep on keep on. Because you know what? Life throws us curveballs. Life's tough. Life's a struggle. Things happen. We weep. We don't understand. I mean, I, I, I told you the story about my whole, my son James, his whole experience and all that we went through. You know, he's 25 now. He uh, came back, played his senior in high school, which was an amazing, amazing thing right there. He, his knees are still bad. He's going to have him replaced probably in his 30s. But, but uh, you guess my son James, with that whole experience, he hated it. <clears throat> would never have chosen it for himself, he would say, hey, God did some incredible things in my life. I'm not sure I'd be the man today if I didn't have that. Uh, keep on believing. So what do you do with your wife? And some of us have had this experience as well. Your wife gets, gets cancer, uh, breast cancer. And Sheila got uh, nine years ago, I think it was. And all of a sudden, she's on the operating table. And they're going to do the mastectomies. Her lymph node tickles out and all that stuff, hoping it's not, not spread to her own body. And they go in there and you, you pray with her and, and, and kiss her. And all of a sudden, they roll her on the other side of that, those doors for the surgery. And you start thinking, is this the end? I'm going to lose my wife. Raised three kids by myself. All that stuff. But what do you do? Well, you cry. You have struggles. It's tough. You don't understand. You have to to miss that. You keep on believing. You keep trusting in Jesus. Why? Because I know Jesus loves my wife more than I love my wife. Jesus has a plan for my life. I don't understand. I can't explain. One day I'm going to know fully, completely, just as I am known. I don't know that. I'm sure. And I can trust my wife with Jesus. You keep on believing. What happens when death comes? Because, man, death's going to come. Right. But the Bible says death for a Christian is no big deal. Death for a believer is, is a transition from here to there. A death for, for a Christian. Death is swallowed up in victory. Uh, there is victory in Jesus. And he's going to conquer that. When I die, you don't have to worry about me. I'm going to be glorious. Because I'm going to see Jesus and be in his presence forever and ever. You keep on believing. You keep trusting him. And we had a, a guy at uh, Baylor. After my junior at Baylor, um, our junior season, we were two and nine in 1973. Before we, the, uh, the year before we beat Texas and won the conference championship in 74. 73, we were two and nine in the conference. Oh, and seven in the Southwest Conference. Awful season. Rice, our last game of the season, <laughs> Rice beat us 27 and nothing. That's how bad it was. <laughs> we come home uh, on the bus. I mean, just low, and, and all of a sudden, we had a team meeting. And all of a sudden, guys, guys started standing up and saying, You know what? I'm tired of getting beat. I don't want to lose anymore. 
So when I was told I'm saying something else, I was saying, Tad stands up and says, you know what? So am I. He said, I'm calling this out, all of us. And he said, kind of something like, man, we're going to start our off-season Monday. Now, you never start an off-season Monday. You always waited after, after the season concluded and test and everything. You started off-season in January after coming back from the break. He said, we're starting Monday. If you're committing yourself to do this, you show up this day at 4 o'clock. If you want to walk away, you just walk away. But everybody who wants to be a part of turning this thing around better than wants to be the state of four o'clock. Some guys didn't show up. In fact, our center, uh, who would have been a fifth year senior, he started uh, uh, three years as a center, he said, you know, I'm not going to. He missed a conference championship because he said, I, I won't do this anymore. Well, we started off season. I mean, it was, it was awful. It was like, I mean, guys were throwing up. I mean, it was the worst job I've ever been through. And just an hour and a half workout, but you're going full speed, oh, hour and a half. It was awful. In the stupid mat room, there was a yell at the whole time, the weight room, the running station, there was all this stuff happening there. We had a guy on our team, a Mike Ebo. Mike Ebo, from Houston, Texas. Huge line, a big old guy. He would yell out a phrase. And it was amazing, he would yell this out at the a perfect time. Is when things were hardest, when it was ugly, and everybody was just I mean, just hard, we a long way to go. He would say, here's what he'd say. He'd say this. Uh, I mean, it's a big old booming voice. Big old black guy. Not that it matters, but, but uh, it's just how he said it, too. It was cool. He, he said this. He'd say, I'm still here! I'm still here! I'm still here! I mean, just yelling. But, I'm still here! <laughs> Nobody's saying <laughs> but what he meant was this. Hey, I'm hurt as much as you're hurt. I'm having thoughts every now and then about quitting. It's like you're having thoughts. This is no fun for me. Like I know it's no fun for you. But I want everybody to know. I'm still here. I'm staying here. We got something. We got to get done. We're going to do this thing. We, know we did it that next year. We won a championship. You know what? The easiest thing in America has been to say, I'm out of here. They quit on their faith, on their wives, on their kids. They quit in to just give it to temptation and that sin that's just kind of dominated their whole life. So they just say, you know what? I'm still here. And I'm staying here all the time. It's that supernatural temptation that they just believe in this stuff, regardless. You know what? It's what Job said. Hey, Job said. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. That's the thing. God, if he takes everything away, I'm still praising and worshiping Jesus Christ. Why? Because nothing that happens here on this earth affects ultimately who he is, who he is in my life, and what I have in my life, in my relationship with him. Amen. I lose my job. That's awful. That's terrible. I lose my health. That's awful. I lose my wife. That's awful. That's terrible. Have a kid through my brother. That's awful. That's terrible. All that's awful. But it does not change who Jesus is. Well, it does not change he's Lord. Does not change all he's done in my life. Does not change he's in control. He's in charge. It doesn't change the fact it's going to end up exactly the way he says it's going to end up. At his feet, according to his plan, his time, his will. It don't matter who's running things. God's in control. He is Lord. You know what? I'm going to trust him. I'm keeping on. I keep it on. That's it. It's a supernatural faith belief. And I'm trusting him all the way in. Here's another thing. Just a supernatural. A man all of a sudden, he believes. And, well, well, well this thought about it, another supernatural thing. Because my point in this, in this session is uh, a man who really believes this stuff. He really believes it. He's experienced it. His life has changed. He knows what he has. He knows who Jesus is. He knows what he's doing in his life. He's passionately pursuing it. He's, uh, uh, God is working in his life in a supernatural way. Manifesting himself powerfully in my life and through my life. By my life. So, as a result of that, I, am, I believe it. <coughs> and I'm making some plays. I'm doing some things to show how much I believe. 
I'm making a play. I'm doing something. Now, for man to be saved, a man, he didn't have to make a play. Jesus has made the play. Amen. He died on the cross. I don't have to do a thing to be saved. If I, 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 I just get to heaven, I don't have to do anything to heaven except believe. That's my sin. Trust Jesus Christ. He saved. It's what he did for me. It's a grace thing. All grace. It's what he did for me. I don't have to do anything. No play has to be made on a man's part except belief. Trust in Jesus. Believe in him. Repent of my sin. But on the earth, how long in my life? If I believe this stuff, I need to do something that shows how much I believe. I take that step of faith. It's, it's a little bit like, uh, I love the story, the uh, uh, first U.S. officer who died on D-Day from uh, uh, enemy fire, June 6, 1944, when we stormed the beaches of uh, Normandy and all that stuff. First U.S. officer who died was a man named, he was a second lieutenant in the uh, 82nd Air Force in an airplane over France, behind the enemy line, just after midnight. His assignment was to take these men who he had personally chosen and trained for six months for this jump, jump out of this plane, land behind the, the beaches, <coughs> capture a bridge which we had to have if we were going to establish a beachhead there at Normandy. They're up there. They're, of course, uh, they're, they're uh, in the plane. Door opens which means you're near the site. There's a red light up there. As soon as it goes green, it means you're over the, the drop zone and you jump. To the right, the light goes red, which means you're hooked up. Door opens. They're standing there. This is before it, it, it changes to green. Anti-aircraft fire is exploding everywhere. I mean, the Germans are alert. They know something's up. They start to put a, uh, uh, a bomb explodes right outside the door of their plane. Hits Matthias, which is his name, Robert Matthias. It explodes. Shrapnel goes through the door, hits him in the chest, knocks him all the way across the plane, knocks him down. He, he stands up. He's still hooked up because they had just hooked up. <coughs> he's still hooked up. He's dazed. He's bleeding profusely. Like everybody said, all of the crew in the plane and, and, and even his guys, after this, uh, when they were talking, they all said that if uh, Matthias had just unhooked himself, Sent his men on, they would have applied emergency aid, struggled back to England, probably would have saved his life. But for Matthias, he knew, hey, this is my moment. These are my men. This is my assignment. <clears throat> Light goes green. He looks at his men, says, Men, follow me. He jumps out of that airplane. They found him an hour and a half later, he was dead. Died from loss of blood or shock, or, or when he hit the ground, or something happened. But his men, who he had personally chosen, who he had trained for six months, who he led into this battle, his men captured that bridge. And as you know, we established a beachhead. And as you know, we won that war. You know how you win a war? You got men who believe in what they're doing, believe in what they're fighting for, and they're making plays all over a battlefield in 10,000 ways, sometimes costing their life. But they're making a play that shows how much they believe. Amen. You know what? How does the church of Jesus Christ advance? You've got men who believe in Jesus. And they're doing something here on this earth. They're making a play that shows how much they believe. Now, what are some plays? Well, of course, I, uh, what he said, the whole idea of having faith, keep on keeping on. Here's a second thought. How about this? A man who says, hey, I, I'm going to love my wife. The way Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I want to love her supernaturally. Not just the way a man can love a woman, the way God can't love a man through a woman. And I want to love her supernaturally. Most men love their wives. Now, of course, all men, I guess, want to love their wives. But most men end up loving their wives more in a contractual relationship. Meaning, she does for me, I do for her. She's good to me, I'm good to her. Now, it's never that blatant. Well, I guess it, it can be, but it doesn't start that way. But it's usually, you know what? If she senses to me, I'll be sensitive to her. If she's responsive to me, I'll be responsive to her. If she's available sexually to me, I'll be you know, nice and kind and sensitive and all that stuff to her. It's more of a contact. She does for me, I do for her. 
You know, God never wanted a man to love his wife in a contractual relationship. Yeah. He wants a man to love a woman in a covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. And the way we're to love our wives is the way Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? Jesus loved us unconditionally, expecting nothing in return. In fact, we couldn't do anything for him. Man spends most of his life trying to get something out of his wife. And if he doesn't get what he wants out of his wife, all of a sudden he's out of there. Now God wants a man to love his wife, expecting nothing in return, loving her. Jesus loves us selflessly. Now you want to think about him, you think about us. A man's love his wife, think of her first. And, and Jesus also loved us sacrificially, meaning he laid his life down for the church. A man is to lay his life down for his wife. You know, that idea, uh, uh, I'm just assuming if I'm in a situation and uh, I'm, it's, it's me or Sheila, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just assuming if, if the bad guy shows up, and, I'm going to lay my life down for Sheila. I, I assume. I don't know that because I've never been in that situation. But hopefully I would. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I would do a, a better job than you guys would. But, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but you know, be, I don't know. But surely I would. But see, uh, here's a, 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 a thought. If, if I waited to lay my life down for her that major moment, and I step in, in front of her and take the bullet, well, I'm dead. I'm gone. I'm assuming she's going to be grateful for that. <laughs> now, I don't know that. But I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming she is. But the point is, I'm off the scene now. Maybe a greater act of love is not waiting that one moment to lay my life down. Come on. How about if I lay my life down every moment? Amen. All of a sudden, it isn't about me, it's about her. It isn't about what I want, it's what she needs. It's about me honoring, serving her, leading her as a servant leader. It's a whole new way. And you know what? Just, I've discovered in my life, you know, I, in so many ways, I, I just, I find myself not being where I am. Learning more and more about me and my relationship with Jesus is more and more in my relationship with my wife. And just little things. For example, how she talks, how she tells a story. I mean, it drives me wild. She starts a story, and I mean, she goes all over the map, all <laughs> over this thing. She'll mention a name, and she starts in the category where she did this, this, this. Of course, none of this applies to the story. And I'm sitting, she's going, and I'm thinking, you killed me. Just, just the facts. It's, what happened? Oh, this is my story. I'm finally getting there. But the whole time she's talking, I'm going, oh, no. Well, what did you tell Well, here's what I'm learning. Why would I be so arrogant to think the only way to tell a story is the way I tell a story? Yeah, come on. That's who she is. What she loves to do is tell her story and tell her all, all that stuff. You know what? Selfishness said, Woman, shut up and give me the facts. Sacrifice love says, Sister, and listen to the woman tell her story. You know why? Because it honors her, it blesses her. And, 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 you know what I'm learning? I'm, I'm learning some stuff like this. Just to lean forward and listen. <coughs> Even, if I'm not really listening. <laughs> I'm trying to listen. And then, you know what I discovered? When she's done telling her story, I've discovered another phrase that just she loves. I'll say something like, honey, tell me more. <laughs> she loves that. You know what I'm finding out? I treat my wife in such a way. I like the way it makes her feel. Yeah, come on. I like the way she is. You know what else? I like the way she responds to my truly loving her unconditionally. You know, another thing is that's also uh, an issue with us is uh, how we drive. How I drive. She thinks I drive too fast, too aggressive. Now, I drive in Dallas all the time. You know, Dallas is like Houston. I mean, it's crazy and stupid. It's ridiculous. But, but, but I drive almost 100 miles every day. People do in hospitals all over the city of Dallas. I never have a wreck. Never have a ticket, ever. I'm a safe driver. But she thinks I drive too fast. And when we drive in some place, and it just drives me wild. She'll also watch her right hand. She'll 
<laughs> should grab the armrest. <laughs> Which means I'm scared to death. Yeah. And of course, I see that. I, I say, what are you doing? Because he said, well, are you talking too fat? I, I, I think it's too scary. And of course, I do I mean, what every stupid male does. I defend myself, and then I attack her. We get in a big order. You know what I'm realizing? You know what? We could take, take our case of me driving too fast, and how she feels about that, because I say I don't, I'm fine. We could take our case to a judge. I present my side, she presents her side. And the judge may even declare, Neil, you're a safe driver. There's no problem. That does not change the way she feels. That's right. Mm -hmm. Why would I do anything to make sure feel afraid even the least? Well, the point is, it's what I need, I need to do. And if I'm with her, I'm, I'm driving slow. I don't have to win. In fact, you know what I started doing in, in, in our relationship? This may be women, but I love it. I let her drive. Come on. <laughs> I have started to let her drive. You know what I do? I've even started doing this. You know what I do? I sit in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and act like I'm being chauffeured around. They don't have a water bottle right there. I'm working on the phone, calling, talking to people, taking doing all that kind of stuff. I mean, and you know what? She loves it. She loves being in charge. I mean, that's the point. You know this whole supernatural idea? Hey, do something huge. Raise the sick, do all you want to do, but then don't miss being a supernatural man. This is Almighty God through your life to your wife. Amen. So she gets loved the way every woman desperately wants to be loved and valued and cherished and nursed and all this stuff about the Bible. You know, if I do anything well in my life, I want to love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. You want to do second, I want to love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I don't want to be that man. You know what? Every woman. But you know, every woman as a little girl dreamed of having a man show up in her life. Her knight of shining armor. Who would rescue her in a sense and love her and just live happily ever after. Most women never experience that. Now they get a man, but uh, he's not shining. I mean, he, he's usually a jerk. And usually a woman, sad to say, spends the rest of her life propping up her husband because he can't do it himself. Come on. Or defending him, or making excuses for him for how he didn't do what he's supposed to do, or, or, or all that kind of stuff. Instead of the man being the leader who truly sweeps her off her heart, and she discovers what a one flesh relationship is like with a man who truly loves Jesus and loves her brother for so much. That's the play I'm going to make him on. Here's another play I'm going to make. We're going to stop. But here's another play. I'm going to be the dad God's calling me to be. I'm making a supernatural play for my kids. So my kids are going to see and experience the reality of Almighty God working through a man's life. So they're going to see that in their own home. Somebody made this statement. I'm not sure it was. Somebody said this. The only thing God can use to make a man is a boy. And what does a boy learn how to be a man? He watches a man be a man. He watches maybe his dad be a man. My thing, I realize, you know, more and more boy, men, didn't have the dad. Maybe they had a dad, but he wasn't there. He didn't love, he wasn't good, all this stuff. I was blessed with a great dad. Wasn't perfect. Had issues, struggled in no way, but you know what he loved us. He loved Jesus, he loved my mom, loved us. I know what a man's supposed to do. You know why I watched the man do it. I just watched the man in my family. Live like well. What is the boy learn how to love America? Be proud to be an American. And, and, and he knows when the flag goes by, you stand up, son. You put your hand. Where do you learn that? You got a dad in your life. Yeah. You say, son, this is what you do. This is why we're Americans. Because, you know, a boy could be raised to love communism, love anything. Mm -hmm. We're Americans because of the freedoms we have and what we, what we believe in. That's got to be taught. What is the boy? When I love Jesus, with all the soul, mind, he's got a dad that loves Jesus. What is the boy? When I love the church, he's got a dad that loves the church. See, son, we're going to church. And I was raised all along. Oh, we were raised in church. Off, we were off. We were never not going to church. We were always in church. You know what? Uh, a lot of times I hated that. I'm, 
When we have Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, we don't have Sunday night church. Actually. We have Saturday night church. We have Sunday night church. We have church on Sunday morning. Come home, have lunch. Start complaining about all the backyard. And then about 4 o'clock, Dad comes, hey, boys, you're going to church. Why don't you get dressed? We left a thousand times driving out of that driveway and, and, and going to the church. I'm looking out the window at all my buddies. <laughs> <laughs> We're always at church, always at church. You know what? All of us, all four of our of, of, of us the boys and our families now, in different places in the world, we're all involved in church. Hey, Jesus hey, Christ. Hey, Why? We had a dad who said, this is what is boy learn how to love the word of God. Be committed to this book. He's got a dad. I was a junior in high school with my dad. <coughs> I'm driving somewhere. He gets his uh, a new, a new, a little brown King James New Testament. Hands it to me, a little with a thin thing. Hands it, I still have this little Bible. Hands it to me. He says, hey. And so I turn to uh, Romans 8. I turned there. I said, I'm going to quote this thing. All 39 verses. He said, you make sure I say every word perfect. You've got to be perfect. Man, I'm looking. I mean, he quoted the whole, all 30. There is no kind of mention of it. I mean, just blew me away. He started me right then on a discipline and with a passion to know and to memorize Scripture. To hide God's Word in my heart and know that I'm not sinning. This boy learned how to love a woman and treat a woman the way a woman's supposed to be treated. He's got a dad. He says, This is how you do it. I remember once I sashed my mom really bad and said some stuff. I was probably in eighth grade. And Said stuff I shouldn't have said, and so on and so on. And just uh, she backs down, and kind of, you know, I think uh, I showed mom, 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 mom. But dad shows up, hears about it, gets in my face, he sticks his nose on my nose. I mean, I can still remember his 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 coffee breath, his his, his, his stubs, the fire in his eyes. And he said, "Son, long before your mom was your mom, she was my wife. Come on, and I don't let any man talk to my wife when you talk." And I see him come. He took that big old right hand of his, and he just slaps him on the side of the head. Well, I had my head up like his, and he took that, he slapped him on the side of the head. You know what? I know what you're supposed to do, and what you don't do. You know, I had a man in my life. You know what? Some of us, and that's something, what we're missing in our life is another man who, when we step off the path of righteousness, a man who can step to us and come and put his hand around our shoulder and say, Son, we can do better than this. Son, this is not what a man does. This is not what you do. You know, we need that. What is the boy learn how to live and all that stuff? Work hard, take responsibility, be honest. How about the woman? What is the boy learn how to maybe die? Watch this dad die. Watch my dad die. As I said earlier, he got pancreatic cancer. This is a bad type to get. He got the worst worst type, that, that third type. They said he got three months to live. He lived a a year and a half, uh, he suffered that awful surgery, lost all that weight, all, he, all the Last six months, he couldn't taste any of his food. My dad loved eating. He, he, nothing tasted good to eat. He died. You know what? My dad was healthy. I watched the man live. Wow. Did life. Wow. When he got sick, he started to suffer. He never complained. Never said, why me? His philosophy was, I, mean, I was faithful and God blessed me and I was healthy. And so, wow. Why would I be anything less now? I'm going to honor him and trust him all the way to the end. I watched a man suffer where well, my dad died. I watched a man die. Wow. I know how it ought to be done. You know why? God, as Isaiah said, God placed a giant oak tree of righteousness right smack dab in the middle of my house. Amen. And it pointed me to that's, that's a supernatural play God did in my dad's life. Again, he wasn't perfect. He had issues. He had stuff in his life. But God did a work in him that impacted us boys. That we supernaturally saw this, and that's the man I love. You know, I love the story. I'm through with this. We'll be done. we got to go. And, uh, uh, you got to say a bunch of stuff and everything. That's what we got to eat. But, you know, I love the, the, that, that, that story. This may be stupid, but most of my illustrations are pretty stupid. But, but uh, this. Uh, Uh, the, the movie uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. Remember that movie? Yes. Yeah. Great. Movie. Uh, it's, it's an awesome movie. Maybe a better book as far as we read it, but it's awesome. But it's the story of this southern attorney living in a southern town. 
prejudiced town, bigoted town. He, uh, the whole story is, is seen through the eyes of his kids, his, his uh, young daughter and son. Well, in the story, of course, a black man is falsely accused of raping a white woman. He's on trial. And this guy, uh, Atticus Fence, is it, it, his character name, it, it's the actor Gregory Peck. And he offends this guy. He does the right thing. Uh, you know, the whole town is against him. I want to lynch the, uh, this guy. And they show up as a mob uh, at the jail one evening, and, and Atticus is right there, stands up, keeps him off. They spit at him. They just, you know, he, does, he, he does the right thing. Well, in the trial, he does the right thing and defends him because he's innocent. But he's found guilty. So the scene is they, they uh, usher him off, whole crowd disperses him in the courtroom, except all the blacks in the town who are up in the balcony. That's what they say. And the scene is Atticus Finch gets his, his uh, satchel at, up on his table, walks to the aisle, and then one of the most amazing moving moments for me in, in, in all of movie history. He starts walking out of the back of the courtroom, and all the blacks stand up in awe of this man. They do the right thing. That Atticus' own two kids were up there in the balcony, on their knees, looking through the radio, so everything that happens. Everyone's standing, they're on their knees. Reverend Sykes reaches down, touches, touches Atticus's daughter on the shoulder, and says, Stand up, Jean Louise. Your father's passing. People <laughs> love it. <laughs> Here's the point. Then I pray I live in such a way, so passionately pursuing Jesus, Him doing a real work in my life. But you know, my son, when our lives pass, my son sees something in me, and you know, he says, I want to be like my dad. Ultimately, which means he ends up being like Jesus. That's a supernatural play I want to make for my life. I want God to in my life and through my life. There's also a supernatural play about, about walking in holiness. What are we going to do with that tonight? Let's pray. Father, we do I thank you that you are God, and I know I'm not. Yet you want to do God things in me. As you work through my past and all the junk in my past to forgive and to cleanse and even to uh, remove maybe even some of the memory from that stuff. All of those are God things. I've got to be able to do that. Lord, also work in me right now knowing that you are I'm headed to a supernatural place heaven. Headed one day to, uh, to be with the supernatural in heaven in glory forever and ever and ever. But now, I've got the supernatural in me through Jesus Christ, which is the hope of glory. Lord, now help me to allow you to work in my life, to draw near to you, and you'll draw near to me, to step out of the boat by faith and trust you. And just, I may not explain it, but just uh, give a witness, say a prayer, give some money, just uh, be a missionary. Just make it do something. Love my wife. Talk to my wife. Listen to my wife. Pray with my wife. Be who I need to be as a dad. Just help us to make that play that the world sees and realizes, you know, hey, man, I know that guy. He's nothing special about him. There must be something special about his God. And they're drawn up to you. You will speak to us and help us be faithful while we do that. So bless the rest of this day and all that we do this afternoon. It will be wonderful. We have a good fellowship. A good time together. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.